Welcome to Talking Transitions at Zero Week Sephora. I am Susan Kish, Vice President of Strategic Communications at OGCI, the Oil and Gas Climate Initiative. Since December 2019, seven of our 12 member companies have announced detailed strategies and targets to reach net zero emissions by 2050 in both their own operational emissions and in the use of their products. Many people are skeptical about the idea of an oil and gas company being part of a net zero future. But if these seven companies alone succeed in implementing their plans by 2050, they will have reduced greenhouse gas emissions by several gigatons. And that is huge. Today, I'm talking to three of these companies, BP, ENI, and Oxy, that are taking very different routes to getting to net zero by 2050. BP, they have set a public target to move into low carbon energies, such as hydrogen and offshore wind, to decarbonize operations, and they expect to reduce their oil and gas production by almost 40% over this decade. We have Dominic Emery with us. He is Chief of Staff to Bernard Looney, CEO, and an important member of our executive committee at OGCI. ENI, they've had climate targets in place for many years and updated them in February to target net zero specifically across all of their equity production and traded volumes with specific targets and strategy around gas, around renewables, biofuels, carbon dioxide storage, and offsets. We are delighted to have their CFO, Francesco Gattei, with us. He is responsible for the company's net zero strategy. Occidental is focusing their net zero strategy on carbon management, investing in carbon capture, carbon use, carbon storage, and carbon removal to help both Oxy and their customers to get to net zero. I'd like to welcome Al Collins, Vice President of Public Policy and External Engagement at Oxy. Stay with us over the next 30 minutes as we explore what they mean by net zero, how are they gonna get there, how confident are they in that path, and why is there still so much skepticism around oil and gas and net zero by mid-century? So let's get started. Our topic is around net zero and the commitments of our member companies, but not all net zeros are the same. So Dominic, can I start with you? Could you define from the perspective of BP what you mean by net zero? So, so we've said we aim to be a net zero company by 2050 or sooner. That represents broadly the kind of the, the destination, the direction of travel for the, for, for the company. And then sitting beneath that, what we've sought to do is to, to articulate 10 aims, five aims that get BP to net zero, and then five aims to support the world getting to net zero. And in, in, in all humility, we will do what we can to support the world getting to net zero. But the five aims that we've art articulated are primarily around um, net zero from our operations uh, by 2050, from the carbon content of our oil and gas production, which is our aim to, and then one around um, halving the intensity, uh, which is our aim three, of the uh, the the products that we sell to to customers. We then have um, additional aims um, supporting the company's intentions to net zero around reducing methane emissions, but seeking to measure methane emissions directly rather than using engineering calculations and standards, and then dramatically increasing the investment in our renewable and low carbon activity um, from around 750 billion last year to three to four billion in the very, very near term. One of the questions that seems implicit, but I just wondered if we could make it explicit, is around your level of oil and gas production. Because to meet those five aims, it would seem that you're going to have to reduce production to get there. Yes, and um, in order to get to net zero by, by 2050, we have set some intermediate targets and aims. So by 2025, we anticipate um, a 20% reduction of the carbon content of the, our oil and gas production, uh, and also our um, essentially our scope one and scope two emissions, which are our operational emissions. And by 2030, we anticipate the, the levels of reduction to be between any, anywhere between 30 and, and 40%. And concomitant with that, we will be um, reducing our production. So we anticipate by 2030 that our oil and gas production would have reduced by about 40% uh, over the next decade which is significant, but kind of necessary in order to meet those, uh, meet those aims. A lot of the discussion around uh, net zero targets and 
trying valiantly to compare them delves into scope one, scope two, scope three. So can you just, for clarity, talk through how that framework of one, two, three matches up with your aims? Yeah, sure. Our aim one around operational emissions is very focused on operated emissions, scope one and scope two. Mm -hmm. um, our aim two is around the carbon content of our production, which uh, our starting point in 20, uh, 2019 was 365 um, million tonnes. Um, which is a, it's significant. It's not far off, actually, the total emissions of the of the UK. Um, and that's what we want to take down to kind of zero. So that is an important kind of scope three component. Now, we, we, we clearly have greater ability to kind of manage the carbon content of our production, our production activities. And we have to work very closely with our bigger customers to ensure that intensity reduction of those products sold to customers reduces at an appropriate rate which is where I think one of the big challenges and opportunities comes in, which is working across big industrial sectors and big emitting sectors like cement, like steel, and also like aviation um, and marine. Al, welcome. And maybe we can start by just asking for you to define in the words of Oxy, what you mean by net zero. What we mean by net zero is addressing all of the emissions from our operations we own a chemical division. So any greenhouse gas emissions that's associated with making those chemical products yeah. are scope one. Um, we, uh, we use a lot of electricity as most industry does. And the emissions associated with the electricity that we use are scope two emissions. And then the scope three emissions are the emissions associated with the products that we, um, <clears throat> that we offer and sell in the marketplace. What part of that strategy is most distinctive to Occidental? I think it's really important that when we talk about net zero, that we focus on the net and not so much on the zero. Well because certainly all of us are doing what we can to reduce our emissions. But we need to couple that with actions like carbon capture, utilization, and storage, direct air capture, other innovative technologies that help achieve that zero. So Oxy's approach to this is, is more focused or focused mostly on innovation through technologies. We've really leaned into carbon capture utilization and storage and direct air capture. So <clears throat> while we're working to become more efficient, to reduce our internal uh, emissions, to reduce the emissions from the power that we use, we're also using these technologies to help offset or to offset the emissions from the use of our products, as well as, the, as our other operating emissions. One of the phrases I often hear describing the Oxy approach is carbon management, that it's a strategy yes. of managing carbon. Can you talk about how that intersects with this net zero part of the strategy? I can. It's, it's an absolutely logical outgrowth of the strategy. Um, Oxy for a long time, for over four decades, Oxy has been managing CO2. We've been um, separating CO2 from uh, our natural gas. We've been compressing that CO2. We've been injecting that CO2. And we've been managing the CO2 in the subsurface and calculating what's stored and uh, recycled uh, what hasn't been stored. So. The carbon management aspect of this, the skills that we gain through that, absolutely position us to, uh, to help others reduce their emissions, to manage large sequestration operations that are outside um, the uh, enhanced soil recovery operations that we gained our experience with. So it's, it's stepping um, forward with the skills that we have learned to implement this in a way that can not only address our own emissions, but help other, uh, other companies that want to reduce their emissions do that as well. And that's what we mean by carbon management. Well, Giorno Francesco, delighted to have you with us today. Thank you so much for joining. So let me start by asking you, how do you define net zero? Uh, clearly, from our point of view, in terms of, uh, of uh, plan to reach the net zero, uh, we want uh, to we take we took a various uh, uh, a very serious approach so we included uh, uh, 
uh, all the missions related to ENI. I think that the standard that ENI is trying to, to push was to include uh, all the mission related to our uh, supply chain. So we are including uh, uh, all our uh, processes, or scope one and two, so upstream and downstream, not excluding any, any specific uh, streams, uh, and also including all our products. So the scope three uh, emissions includes uh, the, um, not only the sales related to products that we produce, but also volumes that we are selling. By 2030, you're looking to reduce scope one, two, three by 25%. Yes. And by 2050, to reduce by what percent? To bring that to zero. To, to bring, bring it to zero, zero. whatever is needed. So, yes. Zero. So the scope one and two, three yeah. was, will be zero in uh, both clearly for, uh, for uh, absolute and, uh, and, uh, and intensity and, uh, and, uh, Substantially, how we reach that is a mix of things. A reduction in the volume of oil and gas, an increase of power generation, and a different solution of biofuel, biogas mm -hmm. and biofuel, and carbon capture. Got it. How confident are you about achieving this? Because it is a complicated portfolio and a complicated engineering challenge. But actually, we are confident because especially we build this uh, through a real engineering uh, process. So it is not just uh, uh, an activity, but we have evaluated the option. We have uh, economic background. So we have CAPES, we have cash flow, we have a uh, rate of return associated to, to, to the different option. Uh, and, uh, and, and therefore, we have uh, a, not only a, a, a plan of reduction of emission, mm -hmm. but uh, we have a, a, an economical plan because to design a, a plan, it is easy, but if this is not uh, economically feasible, it will it will die before reaching the target. So the, 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 the reason you have this uh, also uh, milestone that are gradual, that have using different technology with different speed is that uh, you need time to have this uh, uh, this uh, model to adapt uh, and to fast track certain solution or to mature other alternatives. Al, let me ask you, how confident are you that Occidental can reach your goals and what do you see as the big challenges? I think talking about the challenges first is a, is a good way of approaching this. Uh, because our goals are built upon technology and innovation, uh, we need to deploy the technology. We need to deploy it on, on a wide scale. And that involves things like government incentives, um, faith from the investment community who will be participating in this. And um, it, it, <laughs> it depends upon successful deployment of this. I mean, that's, that's kind of the bottom line of these technologies. I am very confident that we will be able to do that. Um, I feel um, I feel like we have a great plan in place. I think we have a really good team. I think we've really chosen very good technologies and uh, to incorporate uh, into this plan. Um, you know, we're very pleased with our partner, Carbon Engineering, and the technology for their direct air capture. The uh, the development company that we've put together 1.5 uh, to deploy the the direct air capture technology is a um, group of really talented folks <clears throat> you know the goals are pretty ambitious but i i feel i feel very good about that so dominique how about you could you tell me briefly how bp is planning to achieve its targets we we will we will achieve these targets through a combination of, again, operational improvements, project improvements, and portfolio. And the portfolio will be a combination of not doing some things we had intended, um, raising the bar in terms of expectations on the quality of upstream oil and gas, uh, but also um, a divestment profile that's uh, inevitable, it's inevitably going to be part of it. What are you unsure about? What are the unanswered questions? I think the unanswered questions are what happens in the kind of the late the later years. Um, um, there are kind of technologies available to enable further emissions reductions. 
Will they be scalable? Will they be cost effective? So I think, again, a number of companies will say we can probably see line of sight to 70 to 80 percent of the, the reduction technologies at a kind of reasonable kind of cost expectation. But that remaining 20 or 30 percent needs to be kind of thoroughly, thoroughly worked. And what we see is a lot of kind of frameworks, notably ESG frameworks, that kind of supportive of companies that have kind of got there already, um, that are pure play solar companies or pure play wind companies. And that's very important. But I think creating a framework, an inclusive framework, where investors can support companies on their journey to lower carbon on this greening journey is kind of really important. Um, so how we create an inclusive process for investor support to enable that, because it's important actually to follow the emissions and follow the emissions down. It's wonderful being there already as a solar or wind company, um, but really the action is going to happen with emissions reductions. And so this greening narrative, I think, is very important. I think that the most difficult thing is to to have recognized having, having the market recognize that the complexity and the fact that it's not a matter of uh, switching off technology and switching off other technology. So this evolution requires that uh, all technology and all uh, value chain of the company will be a part of the solution, and that there will be actions or options that have to be taken uh, in the legacy assets and uh, action and also financial tools that have to be deployed for the new emerging uh, uh, businesses. So we need to create uh, uh, education in the system, external system, to recognize this uh, articulated uh, uh, challenge. We need to educate internally ourselves to use uh, each different tools with his own uh, different, for example, financing, economic metrics, uh, capability, also, uh, uh, let's say, risk, uh, risk approach, because uh, investing in renewable is completely di- different than investing in, uh, in uh, an oil and gas development. So uh, it is more a matter of uh, recognizing that uh, it is a, a multi-layer challenge that we require multi-layer uh, approaches. And uh, we have to build in this, uh, this know-how internally, but also externally. You work in external affairs and government affairs. Why do you think there's still so much skepticism about the actual commitment of oil and gas operators to make this change? I don't know that I would use the term skepticism, but maybe that is the right term. I think it's just not intuitive to a lot of folks. How can companies that you know, their, their products create greenhouse gases, it doesn't seem intuitive that there's a pathway for them to become, for us to become net zero. So I think it's incumbent upon us to do a lot more explaining about how we see this happening. And I think that must be coupled with a large degree of transparency. I think it needs to be simple and clear. And if there are any caveats to it, they need to be upfront because I don't think helping, uh, I don't think it'll be helpful to, to uh, not be straightforward about that. And, and my goal in transparency is building trust. So we've put an aspiration and a goal out there uh, in order for our stakeholders to feel like we're achieving that, we've got to share information on our progress. And also the challenges that we've run up against too. I, I think it, it um, I, I don't think it's helpful to to not discuss those. What are the open questions that you're still starting to talk about for net zero? So what, what are you still grappling with? I think as an industry, uh, one of the challenges is going to be, you know, when, when companies say net zero, are we all saying the same thing? Uh, because we're looking at the net, net zero, there is a a limitless number of options for achieving net zero or pathways to achieving net zero. And one, I think we have very different operations. We have very different, um, you know, portfolios of what we do. So I think uh, it's the challenge is going to be understanding that um, different companies are going to achieve this in different ways and every way is going to be valid, and and we should all be measured on our progress, not so much the path that we choose. The the difference 
among companies. That's, that's a strength. That's not a weakness because we can all learn from each other. So there's an opportunity there because we're approaching this differently. Um, I think that's a really good thing. So it sounds from the way you're describing that although the destination is clear, the journey is going to be, we don't quite know where that journey is going to take us. And the more we can share the atlases of this unknown territory, so we learn from each other, the better we are in terms of our chance of reading that destination. A final comment from you, Francesco. ENI often talks about the importance of the SDGs and not taking just a Western perspective. Why is that important? I think that so far is a debate that is uh, uh, sometimes too much uh, focused uh, on a Western uh, point of view and Western own uh, uh, expectation and, uh, and, and benefit. Uh, the, the, the country that are in development, uh, they look for reaching the level of uh, development uh, of Western country. We have to find solution for that, for, for this kind of ambitions. So they, we have to find, uh, uh, to, to recognize that if we want to reach a real decarbonization, we have to build uh, 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 alternative to decarbonize in a growing economy. So we have to deploy different options in each country. The goal has to be the same, mm -hmm. to be carbon neutral, but the solution has to be tailor-made for the different economies. And uh, we have to recognize that this is an opportunity for us and not for all. This is just uh, by chance, we are in the right side of the world and we benefit of education, safety, uh, and healthy, and all the opportunity that allow us to grow and to, to become what we are, the, the professional that we are. And uh, we have to use this, uh, this uh, potential to live uh, not only to our, uh, our, uh, our, uh, our sons, our daughters, uh, uh, our children, uh, a better world, but to recognize the fact that uh, there are other children out of our closer uh, circles that have much less opportunity and different uh, needs. Thanks. That was a great answer to close our discussion. Thank you very much to Dominique, to Francesco, and to Al. We look forward to continuing to work with you in OGCI as the industry makes progress towards net zero by mid-century. And thank you all for watching. <laughs>